Good morning, good afternoon, good evening, wherever you are in the world, and welcome to this latest Infrastructure Intelligence uh, webinar event as part of the Infrastructure Intelligence Live series of events uh, organised in association with BECG. And today we'll be discussing, I think, what is a very, very topical issue of delivering a green recovery. And as if luck would have it, it's almost like we designed it. Um, the green recovery, net zero, um, sustainability has very much been in the news uh, this week. There's been a number of announcements that we've seen uh, from the UK government in particular uh, about uh, their plans uh, for, a green, uh, for a green recovery. And I hope that we're going to have a, a you know, very good discussion uh, today uh, around these issues. It's clear that the government, at least in words, are making all the right noises uh, and saying that they want the recovery to be a sustainable uh, one. However, there are some within uh, the environmental sector, indeed there are some within the construction sector, who have a worry that in the rush to growth around project speed and really getting things done as quickly as possible, that the environment doesn't get the attention that it actually deserves. So what we're going to look at today is how do we keep this key issue of sustainability uh, at the forefront of politicians' minds so that we do um, ensure uh, that we get um, a, green, uh, a green recovery. Uh, we've got a really good panel, as always, uh, today uh, for, uh, for, for, for our event. We have um, uh, representation from uh, consultancy firms Mott MacDonald and Jacobs. Uh, we've got the Greater London Authority uh, represented as well. Um, a leading firm uh, of, of, of lawyers who um, have a, a great deal of expertise in the environmental sector with us as well. Um, uh, a green energy group that have been very much in the news uh, this week, which uh, I'll explain a little about uh, later on. And also um, uh, someone from a uh, communications uh, specialist uh, firm who are very much involved in the infrastructure uh, and, uh, and, energy, uh, and energy sector. So I think we've got some very good minds to discuss this very important issue as uh, this morning's webinar progresses. Uh, first up though, I want to introduce our first uh, panelist, who is Kim Yates. And Kim is the UK and Europe Sustainability and Climate Change Lead for Mott MacDonald. Um, Kim uh, is a, a carbon sustainability professional with a particular experience and extensive experience in the transportation uh, sector. She's got more than 20 years experience in the sustainability field uh, and actively promotes sustainability, climate change and the carbon agenda. So I think she's an ideal person to kick us off for this morning's webinar. So Kim, it's over to you. Well, thank you for that introduction, Andy. Um, so just a little bit more of background um, is that I work for Mott McDonald. We're a um, employee owned company uh, and we specialize in engineering, uh, managerial, uh, project management, etc. In, in infrastructure. And that's our business. And certainly what I do as part of my my role is I deal with infrastructure projects, trying to make them more sustainable, bring down that carbon from them. And I love working in this sector because it's a challenging one. It's something that we can make real big differences on, um, but it is hard. It's hard to do. So the question is, is yeah, we're getting all the right feelings and sounds from our politicians, from our decision makers, and I do apologize, I have to talk with my hands, I'm one of those people. Um, and it's all about Build Back Better, the green recovery, we're hearing all the right buzzwords, we're hearing everything, everything going on. But what is the concern behind all of our, in, in the back of all of our minds, is actually it is a build, 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 not necessarily a Build Back Better and green recovery as such. But having said that, again, we've got all the right movements, we've got all the right sounds going on. And also, although we're in a interesting position with COVID, is that what we have seen with COVID is massive 
behavioural change. The way that we've lived our lives, the way that we're doing things now is there's a paradigm shift in the way that we're doing things. Um, and certainly from a greenhouse gas perspective, we're expecting massive dips as a result of, um, of, of COVID. But what we've actually seen, the latest predictions are in the region of only a 4.6% reduction in greenhouse gases. This varies depending on which study you're looking at. So although we've changed the way that we're living and the way that we're doing things, that hasn't necessarily arrested that going for 2050, uh, aligning with the 1.5 degrees C um, reduction in temperature for 2050. But again, going back to what we're hearing on the news, something I never thought I would see in a million years is um, China going carbon neutral in 2060. Who would have thought? Um, so again, we're hearing the right things in the UK, net zero for 2050. And despite everything, it still is front of mind in our politicians and in our decision makers and in our day-to-day -day lives, we do care. So again, what we've shown is public opinion, despite everything, is still making this front and centre about what we're, what we're trying to deliver and what we're trying to do. Dear old David Attenborough on the telly as well is also bringing this front and centre. So I think ensuring that it is front of mind in politicians and decision makers minds, they have to be living under a rock, quite frankly, if they haven't, haven't noticed this. But okay, so we've set the scene and, and to all intents and purposes, it's looking good. But, for example, with Heathrow way back in February, we were all set to build um, the third runway, um, but it was stopped in February. So I've, I've been in this business a very, very long time, and I have never seen a major infrastructure program stopped on grounds of climate change. And actually, if you start to delve into the scene behind it, it, was, um, it wasn't so much what Heathrow were doing. They were aligning with guidance. They were aligning with everything that needed to be done. But the policy itself did not align with that 1.5 degrees C by 2050 and the Paris Agreement. So actually, there's a lot of catching up to do. And when we think about sustainability, actually to get true sustainable outcomes, it's not about complying with policy, which you have to do. It's not about compliance, but it's about going that extra level um, to get those, those outcomes. And again, when we look at sustainability itself, it's not just about the environment, it's that balancing act of the social and the economic, because if we don't have viable economic conditions, we don't have good social outcomes, we do not have good environmental outcomes. And so again, the challenge is going to be is getting the balance right with what is good for the economics, what is good for the social outcomes, and also what is good for the environment. And when you get that balancing act right, particularly when we're looking at infrastructure, we have beautiful schemes that are sustainable for the future and for our children. Okay, so I touched on briefly on sustainable outcomes and, and what is sustainability. Just as a little heads up, last night, the, if anyone's heard of the infrastructure carbon review. So again, we've been on a very long journey with this in terms of reducing our carbon outputs from construction. But what we found is that although all the other industries, energy, transportation are reducing their carbon in the UK, the construction industry is still continuing to go up. So again, we need that paradigm shift. I'm also aware that I'm hogging spot and I need to roll up in a minute. But these, these are the things that um, we've, I think we've got the right conditions. I think it is front and center of, of politicians' minds, but I'm aware that they have to balance this with the economic outcomes. Um, but I just want to also go back to the, anybody heard of the NASA cleaner? 
is that we're all on this journey together to make things more sustainable, get better outcomes all the way through. And it's not just the decision makers or the politicians who govern this, it's all of us. So one of the cleaners at NASA and the landing of the moons, somebody asked them, what are you doing here? He said, I'm putting a man on the moon. And that's what we're all doing. And it's all our personal responsibilities to do what we can, as well as the decision makers and the politicians. Thanks very much for that, Kim. Uh, some really interesting points, um, as we always get on these uh, on these events. The, the, the fact that this is an issue that's front and centre, but at the same time, there's that balancing act that the politicians have to perform. But at the same time, we've all got an interest in this. You know, this affects everybody. Uh, and at the end of the day, we are actually talking about, um, you know, people's future, the future of the planet, in fact, really, when we come down to it. Uh, and I think, you know, I think if we keep that in mind, that can actually uh, help inform, um, you know, I suppose the seriousness of the, uh, of the situation. She will come back to many of those points in the discussion. There's already questions coming through in the chat. If you do have a question for our panel, for our esteemed panel, then please post your question in the chat and we'll do our level best uh, to get to it. If you want to tell us where you're from as well, um, if you're that dexterous on the keyboard, then do that if it's relevant. Uh, then uh, do um, then do let us know uh, about that as well. Anyway, we must move on to our second panelist, who is Donald Morrison, who's a senior vice president at Jacobs People and Places Solutions UK and Europe. Uh, Donald's been with the company for more than 27 years, and he leads over 8,000 people in the delivery of critical buildings, power, transport, water, and environmental projects and Jacobs are involved in many, many high profile um, uh, infrastructure projects uh, around uh, the world and sustainability I know as it is for all consultancy firms and contractors and everyone involved in the construction sector is an absolutely key and central issue to what they do. So Donald, uh, the floor is yours. Great, thanks, Andy. Um, actually, 28 years come Monday um, is my anniversary with the with the organisation. Congratulations uh, you know, for Monday. Thank you. And uh, maybe a nice segue from what Kim just said. I, I think that um, janitor at uh, NASA was possibly a Jacobs employee or an indirect employee because we have over three and a half thousand people working with NASA. Um, so working as well as in the kind of... Um, infrastructure space, you know, we, we genuinely do have rocket scientists in the company. So it's great to be able to bring that kind of diversity of thought uh, to this discussion. So just maybe sharing a few thoughts and then just some ideas around priorities that might focus the discussion later on. You know, in just over a year, the UK is going to play host to the COP26 event, a key moment for the, the, the nation to establish um, its ambitions again in becoming a global leader in a uh, green economic recovery. You know, we know that the UK government recently pledged to build back greener, as Kate's already said, and uh, build back better and build back quicker via project speed. And that kind of ambition is something that really excites us um, as an organisation and I think should do as an industry as well. And we've seen much discussion over the last seven months now in the time warp that we're in around the, the pandemic um, and the, the reset button that that's effectively pressed from a, a carbon emission perspective. And I know Kim quoted one um, statistic, if I can quote another, I think the International Energy Association puts the reduction from COVID related, related measures as having an impact of about 8% on emissions. And that just shows how quickly changes in people's behaviour can make big differences in the short term. But then if we look, you know, what, what did it take to achieve just that 8% reduction? You know, are these behaviours really possible to maintain? I think in the UK in April, car traffic was about half of what it was in April 2019. And then for months, there was virtually no tra um, air traffic. I think at the, at, at the lowest point, Heathrow was down at 3% of what it had been 12 months ago. So that 
you know, nobody wants to continue that kind of situation. But I believe there, you know, we're still on track to emit over 92 percent of what we, carbon that we did um, uh, back in 2019. So whilst it looks like we're about to, you know, enter a new phase of restrictions across the UK, some of them starting, you know, just just today. You know, I'm ever, I'm always a cup more, definitely more than half full person. The, the economy is going to open up. And as somebody said to me just recently, when they were complaining about how long this was taking, they can say one thing for certain, we're one week closer to the end now than we were last week. And I think that's a really good perspective to take on it as we look to the future. And we need to act now um, as if we're going to so that we can give that level of protection to the planet. And I think that's got to be bold. But if I go back to the government ambitions in this space is around build, 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 I think we've got a critical opportunity at the moment to step back and do a bit of think, think, think. And you know what kind of um, societal incomes uh, um, outcomes do we want from this building? You know, the achieving the leveling up agenda. I think we've got a great opportunity there um, to really embed some new social value thinking, and um, you know, really a, a new focus on net zero and, um, and you know, overall um, holistic environmental objectives. And you know, as an organisation, we see ourselves right at the centre of that, about that ability to think differently about infrastructure in this way, and do really challenging today and um, to reinvent tomorrow. So maybe just to wrap up some ideas around you know priorities that I believe um, industry, business, and uh, government and stakeholders need to take. And if I can just give you sort of five of my thoughts in that space, I think. In the UK, certainly over a number of years now, I think we um, belittle significantly what our, our ability, if we compare that back into sort of the, the time of the Industrial Re Re Revolution. So I, I, I absolutely see this as a great opportunity, um, that the, the COP26 race to zero. It gives us, um, you know, I think a 30-year target, you know, that idea of having a vision there. And taking action um, now is absolutely the right thing to do. And I think we need to do that with a renewed level um, of ambition. Jacobs as an organization is committed to being 100% renewable energy and achieving net zero this year, and then being carbon negative by 2030. And I, and I know there's many other organizations rep represented in this call who will have similar bold objectives. And I think the government could be even bolder. Secondly, I think we need a new level of ambition. Um, I think we're at a pivotal stage in the UK's journey to a greener economy. Um, and climate change will touch every area of society. And I think we are seeing a more purposeful society, even as an impact of the pandemic at the moment. And we need to commit to huge transformation and um, to accelerate the kind of emission cuts that we need to achieve the, the climate um, change um, aspirations. I think you know there's a really specific issue, thirdly, around government ambition at the moment, because there could be a real temptation if we go build, build, build under project speed um, to cut corners. And this can't be just about a focus on net zero carbon or decreasing unemployment in isolation. And I'm a great believer in really looking at much more integrated infrastructure solutions we too often take siloed decisions against, you know, you know, across different modes of transport, for example. And I think if we can really take a holistic um, view here, we can advance a much more longer term um, approach and generate higher rates of return by new ways of um, measuring that. And in this industry, still sticking with this point around the temptation to cut corners, I think we are bad at actually learning how to fail fast. And we, we sometimes fail, um, you know, for the fear of failing. And I think we can really focus on, um, you know, just taking bolder solutions at this stage. Fourthly, I think, as I alluded to earlier, I think there's a new opportunity to just look at how we assess schemes in, in the UK at the moment and their societal impact particularly as we look at the whole life cycle of projects. Um, there's too many decisions taken on you know, inevitable ways of scheme assessment at the moment. 
And we've recently formed a, a, a partnership in Jacobs with an organization called um, Symmetrica. And through the Symmetrica Jacobs partnership, we can now measure and quantify social value uh, in, in transport and infrastructure projects and in more um, maybe exciting projects like things like the sports and media. And we're doing a lot of work in that, that space. That's an innovation that we're really proud of, and we think we can leverage that into the infrastructure space. And I think last but not least in this space, Andy, before I hand back to you, I think we need to look at these commitments as our moral imperative, um, that you know, where we align business promises with government policy and creating um, much more proactive solutions. So I believe we can build back greener, better and quicker. We have to make that change. Um, the pandemic has pre presented us with that opportunity to press the reset button. But let's think about every part of the process here, the role that, you know, that even the organisations in this call can play. But let's understand what people really want from us, what the, the, the outcomes that we're really trying to achieve. And I, I've got a lot of confidence that we are taking the smarter routes that will you know, achieve longer term benefits for the, for the industry. And I'm excited about the, the role that uh, we can play as Jacobs and many other organisations represented here can play. Thanks. Thanks very much, Donald, for that. And thanks uh, for reminding us about COP26. Obviously, it's a disappointment to many people that that event is not taking place. Uh, along with many others uh, this year, because I think there's no question that there, there was a, a, a massive opportunity um, for the UK to platform some of these issues at that global event. Obviously, it's an opportunity that we now have again next year, and maybe something we can discuss further uh, in the discussion about the opportunities um, and also the opportunities for you know for the sector as well in that event, particularly like what you said as well about think, 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 which I think is really important uh, as we build our way out of um, the, the COVID crisis. So a lot to think about there uh, for the discussion um, as well. Um, time for our next um, speaker uh, now, and the, the next speaker is Phil Graham, who's the Executive Director for Good Growth at the Greater London Authority. And obviously London, um, as a place, as an entity, extremely important um, to this whole issue um, of uh, climate change uh, and net zero, just because of its sheer size and also its influence as well uh, on the rest of uh, the country as being the, uh, you know, the nation's capital. Phil um, joined uh, the GLA in January 2020 and he leads their work uh, across a number of sectors, including transport, infrastructure, planning, economic development and regeneration, environmental policy and culture. So he's got a really um, influential role um, on this particular issue. Um, in a, it, I nearly said in a previous life, but I'm sure it's still his current life, uh, Phil was also Chief Executive of the National Infrastructure Commission. So he knows his stuff on this and, uh, and other issues. So, um, Phil, um, your turn next. Over to you. Uh, thank you, Andy, um, and thanks for inviting me. Um, I, I guess I kind of start from the question that Ian Parker has asked in the chat about whether a green recovery will, will hinder the government's main challenge, and indeed a number of our, one of the key challenges we all face, I think, about safeguarding the economy during the COVID crisis. But, I mean, I don't know whether Ian asked the question as a provocation or as a, uh, or, or, as a or, as, or, or, or because he genuinely thinks that might be the case. But I mean, my position is, could not be more the opposite. I mean, my view is very, very strongly that a green recovery is the opportunity, provides the opportunity to safeguard the economy and to bounce back faster than would be the case otherwise. The green economy has been growing substantially faster than other parts of the economy in the run up to this crisis. It's one of the few parts of the economy which has maintained a pattern of growth during it. And also responding to, to COVID and building back after COVID, you know, green principles are at the heart of that. You know, Air quality has been shown to be heavily correlated with, uh, with the worst health impacts of the COVID crisis. Um, outdoor space and green space is a critical part of this. Green infrastructure is, is hugely relevant to how we create a city that, uh, that is healthy 
and that makes us more resilient to future to, to future crises of this kind. So I think I think a green recovery has to be, in many ways, the, the cornerstone of of how we safeguard the economy and how we how we build the, the economy on the back of this, both in London, in the UK, and ultimately internationally. Um, and certainly, part of my role is to ensure that the city that emerges from this crisis. Um, has a has a has a stable growing economy but is also one that is fairer smarter greener more equal than the than the city that than the city went in and that's why what we what we to use the phrase of the moment a green new deal is one of the nine missions that forms um the developing recovery strategy that we've been putting together in london the GLA working in partnership with the boroughs, with Transport for London, with the London University sector, with the NHS and other partners, and also why environmental sustainability is one of the cross-cutting themes that runs throughout that programme, rather than sort of sitting solely in a, in a, in a box focused specifically on environmental programmes. So the Green New Deal mission um, is going to focus on three areas, one of which is energy, energy efficiency and retrofit. And we're going to be looking to um, accelerate very strongly the work that we already have in hand to try and uh, improve the energy efficiency, particularly of London social housing stock, also other public buildings. Um, we're going to be looking at how we, can, how we can work with governments and deploy some of their funds effectively into private homes. Um, and also looking at how we can support um, the, de the, the delivery of low carbon generation within London. So there's an energy efficiency and retrofit element to this. There's a transport and green space side to it. You know, we've seen extraordinary changes in London as in some other cities in terms of a switch towards more active modes of travel. We've been allocating road space very temporarily to promote that. You know, that has two effects. Partly it makes it easier to walk and cycle, but also by removing road space from private vehicles, it, may, it discourages a car-based recovery, which you know, London simply cannot afford. We don't have the road space. We, that's not how the city, could, the city car function in that way. So there's a part of, the, part of the, the recovery strategy, which is about trying to embed those changes, about trying to make those, them permanent, and also to ensure that we build upon the the, uh, the the green space that London actually compared to many other world cities is rich in but we need to make sure that that's accessible to all our communities that we're addressing some of the degradation that we've seen over over recent years and creating a greener city um, and then finally and critically because this plays across all of these we've also got quite a strong focus on green finance and we've uh, we're doing some work with the Green Finance Institute um, as to how we can, how London's public sector and other bodies can access some of the green finance opportunities more effectively that's going on at the moment. You know, there are, there are pension funds, both in the public and private sector. There, there, there are, there's the Green Investment Bank, you know, but more critically, even, you know, the, the idea that environmental investment is somehow a nice to have compared to so-called commercial investment is simply you know, those distinctions are, are drawing away. Environmental investment is some of the most profitable investment there can be if you get the project right. Um, so we need to bring that together and make sure those opportunities are coming forward. But more widely, and there is a huge job to ensure that the green economy and sustainability are front and centre across how we, across the approach that we take in London and in other cities to recovery. That's in thinking about health. We've talked about air quality. We've talked about mental health and assets to green space. In terms of civil society, in terms of bringing our third sector groups and our community groups into this agenda, in terms of the work we do on skills and employment, if this is a growth sector, you know, we need to make sure that we're training our young people and training those who, who, need, to, who need to find new jobs to, to work in that, and about equality and inclusion. You know, one of the biggest impacts of COVID has to be to reveal very, very clearly the deep-seated inequalities that, that exists within London, that exists across other societies. And there's, there's no excuse for a, sort of, for a sort of halo effect within the green sector about this. You know, that, that because we do good work on sustainability, we therefore don't have a challenge in terms of, in terms of the inclusion agenda. You know, it, is a, it is a sector with a lack of diversity. Uh, with the best will in the world, this panel is a bit, of a, bit of a bit of an example of that. And we need to do more to ensure that jobs, particularly in London, 
are are accessible to underrepresented groups, accessible to to young people from our black communities and for other ethnic minorities. So there is a massive opportunity here. There is there is much greater alignment than I than I have ever seen between national politics, between local and regional politics, and between sort of financial and economic considerations. And I think the the government's recent the recent announcements about offshore wind are a good example of that and a, and a huge step forward. I mean, even two or three years ago when I was when we were looking at uh, sort of future pathways for renewables with the National Infrastructure Commission, the idea that the go that the government would have would have made such a bold announcement in terms of reliance on offshore wind was 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 certainly unexpected. But with the best will in the world, off offshore wind and power generation is the easy bit. Now, the finances add up very, very well. Renewables costs are plummeting. The technology is developing. It's win-win for everyone. We're going to, have, you know, we need a government that is prepared to do the hard stuff as well. And I mean, it was noticeable to me that in, in that long list of of, of important green issues that Boris Johnson talked about, um, decarbonising heat. Um, which is probably the trickiest challenge we had didn't even figure and that's and that's something that we cannot ignore for any any longer we need to look at how you how you decarbonize heat how you deliver modal shift how um, new infrastructure such as smart charging and intelligent energy systems can can be rolled out to all of our neighborhoods not just the most prosperous ones um, and there's other hard stuff as well. We need to look at PM 2.5 as well as NOx. You know, there, is, there are some things that electrification of the vehicle stock will deliver, but not, not everything. Um, so there is a huge opportunity here, but there are still huge challenges. I think the idea of a green recovery is, is at the, should be at the heart of all of our thinking in terms of where we go next on the back of, our, uh, back of this pandemic. But... I mean, I think there is a sense that everyone in this discussion has already captured. I'd be surprised that if anyone disagrees with me that, you know, there's that great phrase, never let a crisis go to waste. Um, and I think this crisis is leading to, to the kinds of shifts in perspective, the kind of changes in behaviour that give us a new base from which to build. Sustainability is increasingly and will be part of London's USP. It's the fact that London is a sustainable city is part of the reason why investment, why talent, why, why global business has, has historically wanted to work here and we need to build on that. But it is going to require focus, effort, persistence and a joined up approach across, across business and across government at all levels. So I've got a lot of hope for the future, but there's a lot of work to do. Thank you. And can I be the first to say you're on mute? Very good. I was just saying thanks very much for those uh, insights, and I know that we'll come back uh, to many of them uh, in the uh, you know in the in, in in the discussion. Interesting that you mentioned that the whole retrofit uh, agenda as well, which you know was spoken about. I think quite widely. Um, I think way back when the Chancellor made one of his first speeches around investment and recovery. I'm not sure we've heard enough about that since actually this whole concept of a green new deal as well and i think that's something that we need to explore uh, in more uh, in more detail uh, if we've got the time but we've got to crack on because uh, time uh, as it always is uh, is against us uh, this morning our next um, panelist is stuart kearns who's a partner at the international law firm bird and bird for those that aren't aware of uh, bird and bird they uh, specialize in business sectors where technology plays a role. So unsurprisingly, they're very much involved in uh, the sustainability uh, uh, sector in, uh, in particular. Stuart works in um, the company's uh, commercial practice where he focuses on public sector and utilities procurement, particularly in infrastructure. And he's worked extensively uh, with government and regulated bodies, both nationally uh, and internationally. So I'm sure he will uh, give us some uh, insights here that I think we can, uh, you know, all think on and hopefully spark further discussion on during the course uh, of the next uh, uh, hour or so. So, Stuart, uh, over to you. Thanks, Andy, and uh, good morning, everyone. Very pleased to be here speaking with you today about this obviously very uh, important topic. Um, you know, just to explain further, not least to, to 
to, I suppose, um, give you some understanding of the, the angle I'll take on this. You know, my day-to-day -day work is very much about helping clients, whether they be government bodies or, or regulated utilities or even private sector organizations, come up with a, a procurement process to allow them to make the right decisions, to allow them to make very robust decisions, to make decisions which are consistent with what they want to achieve. And uh, achieving environmental objectives is absolutely at the heart of all of that at the moment. So uh, environmental sustainability, I think, along with the integration of digital technology are probably the two most prominent themes in all the projects I'm doing, whether that be in the UK or, or internationally. It's the thing that clients consistently say they want to achieve. They want to deliver a project, usually an infrastructure, that you know, respects the environment that contributes to government objectives. And often those solutions have a, a digital angle. So the two things are very much converging. Um, and I think it's very clear that, uh, you know, as they look to do that, they're keen to secure the right support in doing that. And that often the procurements that we're involved in uh, are as much about appointed advisors to deliver an infrastructure solution as it is about the infrastructure solution itself. So very, very key. And I think that, uh, that point is critical and that it, I think it aligns with something Donald says about making sure that you have an understanding of what it is you're wanting to achieve or even have an understanding of what is achievable. And my perspective on this is that in order to allow you to do that, you very much have to surround yourself with organizations and advisors and professional support that can support your ambition so that have an understanding and a level of expertise to enable you to achieve all that you want. So one of the, the, the most common discussions I have at the moment is very much how do we make sure that we can pick the right team to support us? And that's all in the context of a procurement. Again, whether that be regulated or unregulated, it's all about challenging bidders, challenging professional advisors who want to work with you to demonstrate that they can add value, that they understand the challenge in this context that's environmental. But you absolutely want to make sure that that's core to what you do through the process. I think as with anything in procurement, if it's important to you, you need to make it part of the theme of that procurement. You need to make it the golden thread, the thread that weaves its way from the very outset of the engagement with the market right the way through into the delivery of the contract. Unfortunately, I think there is, it is quite often the case that uh, you know, things like environmental sustainability are only sound bites for some clients, or actually for some clients, they say they want to deliver a more environmentally sustainable solution, but actually don't know how to go about it. And it's key that if it is important to you, that you actually put it at the heart of what you do, particularly from a procurement perspective. You know, I hear it from bidders quite frequently. They say, that when they're talking to clients and prospective clients, that the clients tell them that they want an environmentally sound solution, but actually don't then support that by putting in place a process, for example, that um, incentivizes bidders to be more innovative in that regard or rewards them for, for coming up with better solutions or even lets them enter into a contract that facilitates all of this. So if it is important to government, if it is important to client organizations, then it's got to be at the core of everything. It's got to be at the core, I think, of early stage engagement. You know, I'm a big fan of pre-market engagement and speaking to prospective partners before you actually start a formal process to award. And the benefit of that is not least to warm up that market and make sure you have interest, but more importantly, the right interest from the right organization, but also it allows you to test assumptions it allows you to test that actually what you're trying to achieve is possible, that what you are trying to achieve can be delivered within the timescales or within the ways that you describe. So I think good market engagement is critical to this. It then can be a key decision, I think, in terms of shortlisting. You know, if it's fundamentally important to you to deliver an environmentally sound project, then I think you want to only work with those that understand how important that is and that can support you in that objective. So use it to shortlist. Don't waste your time talking to those who don't get it or can't help. Similarly, it's going to be part of your award decision. It's going to be part of what you do. It should be a key aspect of your specification and a key aspect of the methodology you use to pick the, the right partner or partners. You know, 
If it is important, again, it should be part of your, your golden thread. And finally, having secured all these fantastic promises from organizations who say that you can help, it must be part of the contract. Make it not just part of the contractual requirement, but make it part of the day-to-day -day, day -day engagement you have with those organizations. A standing item on the agenda every time you meet or a positive obligation to report and progress is a good way to, oh, that was bad timing, um, a good way to make sure it happens. And I think that's key. If it's important to you, put it at the heart of everything you do in the context of your procurement. And that's it for me. Thank you, Andy. Thanks very much, um, Stuart, um, for that. I think, you know, really strong message there to, towards the end when you said only work with people who get it. Um, if, if that was the case across the board, then obviously we'd be 90%, um, you know, basically towards achieving what we want to achieve. Um, obviously, that's not always the case. But again, I think there's food for thought, uh, food for thought there. Um, our next um, speaker um, is uh, someone from um, the energy sector um, itself. Uh, and it's, um, it's an energy company, a green energy company, uh, who very much uh, were in the news uh, this week. In fact, uh, the Prime Minister himself um, responding to the announcement that Octopus Energy uh, were going to create a thousand jobs in the UK, uh, said, and I quote, it's UK tech companies like Octopus who will ensure that we continue to build back greener and remain a world leader in pioneering renewable energy, leading the path to net zero while creating thousands of skilled uh, jobs. So apart, apart from saying no pressure uh, to our uh, next speaker, who is uh, in fact Clementine Counton, who is the Director of External Affairs at Octopus Energy Group. I think it's you know really important, I think, that on a panel like this, we actually do have someone um, from the um, you know from the front line as it uh, as it were, good job. I didn't say that cliched phrase coal face because that would have been completely inappropriate uh, for a, for a, a webinar of this uh, of this uh, subject. Uh, just a quick uh, word uh, on on Octopus. In 2016, uh, they entered uh, the the energy market with the stated aim of disrupting the status quo by providing energy in their words, that's good for the planet, good for your wallet, and also good for your soul. And since then, uh, they've been picking up uh, around about 30,000 um, customers a month on average, if their website uh, is up to date. And they now supply energy to 1.5 million UK homes. Um, and obviously they were in the news recently, uh, on Monday this week, with their plans to create um, a thousand new green jobs in the UK. Anyway, that's enough <laughs> from me about Octopus. Uh, it's over to uh, Clementine Counton with an Octopus next to her who's going to give us some benefits of her insights. Clementine, over to you. Thanks very much, actually. Very helpfully, I've just been deleting sections of my remarks as you've been covering them off for me. So <laughs> that's a very good time saving uh, initiative. Um, uh, so I guess kind of continuing on from what Andy said, um, so we, we, do, we serve 1.7 million households in the UK with, with green energy. We also have an electric vehicles business and an energy services business. And our proprietary digital platform, Kraken, um, allows that to be done much more cheaply and with vastly better customer service. We are the only energy supplier to be recommended by which three is running um, and we are regularly at the top of trust in fact we are at the top of trust finance um, reviews not just of, of energy companies actually but much more widely customer service businesses um, uh, but it's also a kraken is also designed to we we built that that um, digital technology to help absorb more renewable power onto the grid and and harness the power of consumers to drive the green energy revolution. Over lockdown, we became the UK's latest tech unicorn um, with a $300 million investment, which valued us at over a billion pounds. Um, and we've expanded into the US, Germany, and Australia with lots more to come. Um, our mission is to make green energy the cheapest energy and drive net zero at global scale. Um, I, I, I suppose I've been asked to give um, a perspective on how to communicate with government um, 
partly on the back of the the visit that we had on Monday. But so I I, th I thought I'd kind of um, maybe give some insights into how it is that Octopus is is able to um, to command the attention of politicians and to help drive that change, and also to maybe give some thoughts of how how you guys might might take that on in your sector. So. Um, I think the first one is to demonstrate optimism. Um, we've concentrated on accelerating what we can do while investing in a rapidly iterating future technologies and then communicating that, that optimism. So the conversations we have in, in government are, look, we're here, we can do this, we can prove that we can do this, let's get on with it. Um, we also, I, I, we take an approach of sort of show then tell. So rather than um, hypothesizing about something that might be able to happen if, if a policy happened, um, we, we actually just get on with it and do it. And um, one, one great example of that is our agile tariff, which is a dynamic time of use tariff that allows customers to um, get, um, have vastly cheaper energy at times of the day when there's lots of renewables on the grid, which ultimately will allow more renewable power to be absorbed onto the grid. And at times, um, electric vehicle drivers, for example, although anybody is able to um, access it, is um, are sometimes paid to charge their, their cars. You can, we've had um, quite a few times when there's been so much renewable energy on the grid that uh, national grid is threatening to, to pay generators to turn it off and we've been able to soak that up on behalf of our customers that's the kind of customer-based innovation that you can just get on and do if you don't allow policy and regulation to hold you back um, if you know if, if you know a, te a technology or a approach is important build it now and that will give the government confidence to back it up with policy um, and I think that's particularly relevant actually in ahead of COP26 that that's an opportunity for the UK to showcase showing rather than telling and, and getting on with the job and then I think the, the third um, lesson is is to put your put your arm around customers and bring them along with you if you build products that customers love you give them great service they will be the, the most powerful advocates that you can have um, it's always worth remembering um, when you're talking to to politicians that customers are also voters um, i guess my plea to the infrastructure sector um, house builders in particular but but more widely um, and and is to you know in, in how, how what's the best kind of way to direct your efforts in the, in the immediate term it's um and particularly those delivering new homes is get behind electric heat and heat pumps. Um, those, these are technologies that are available now, right now, that we don't have to wait for them to be invented. Um, unlike with, for example, hydrogen boilers, um, they're truly green, um, they are safe. Um, and by bringing to bear the kind of scale that you guys are able to with the, with the level of building that we hope you'll, you'll be empowered to do, they will rapidly reduce in cost and that is how you will have an incredibly meaningful impact on that very hard to reach sector which is heat as Philip was saying. Um, if, you, if you demonstrate optimism on electric heat and get out and deliver it, the government will jump on board and we'll be able to turbocharge our, elect our net zero revolution and I think we can be very optimistic about getting most of the way there by 2030. Thanks very much for that, Clementine. I think really interestingly there, that insight about being optimistic uh, and, and, and actually, you know, having that dialogue with government, I think is really important. Um, obviously, um, you know, it's something that, that, that you guys have done to some, um, you know, really good effect, uh, you know, with the, and it helps when you've got a good news story to announce as well. And it coincides with the government's agenda, uh, which is all about alignment, I suppose. But I think it is important to be optimistic. And I think it, it's also important, particularly for our sector, I think, to be bold as well around these issues. Because too often, I think we do hide our light under a bushel and we don't necessarily um, communicate uh, things in the way that we uh, maybe ought to, particularly when we've got a good story to sell, which actually neatly takes me on uh, to our next speaker, who is Jamie Gordon, who's a director for infrastructure and energy at the uh, Built Environment Communication Specialists, BECG and BECG, who are sponsoring our infrastructure intelligence series as well. I always look forward to uh, Jamie's insights because not are they as the word implies, uh, very insightful. Um, I also think that Jamie 
uh, often asks the questions that many people are thinking about or raises the issues that many people are thinking about, but are maybe a little bit too timid sometimes to actually put them on the table. Anyway, we'll find that out in a minute after I've given him such a big build up. Jamie, over to you. Well, thanks a lot, Andy. I hope I live up to that introduction. Um, well, the green recovery, which is what we're talking about today, is obviously a very emotive subject. It's not only are we talking about recovering from what is probably the worst global event since World War II, but also how we avoid what will be the worst global disaster ever. Um, now, that all sounds a rather gloomy way to start, I suppose, but what I'm going to try and be is an optimist and play the part on today's panel of a bit of an idealist. Um, now, Malcolm mentioned this 8% reduction we had during lockdown. And I remember how many friends I had saying they were enjoying cycling on empty roads and they definitely cycled to the office when it was all over. Well, I saw at least five of them on the train yesterday and none of them had a folding bike with them. Uh, because we know behavioural change is easy when it's forced upon us. It's not really behavioural change, is it? It's just adhering to the regulations. So when you remove those regulations, most people just return to their previous ways and what they were doing before. And we know as we are likely to come out of C19 into a recession, it's gonna be all too easy to just carry on as before, probably even take more advantage over cheap oil, cheap travel, cheap clothes, uh, cheap housing, all to get the economy going again and boosted. So what we really need is the government policies that incentivize a reduction in emissions and to penalize people who do not consider the environment when building or, or rebuilding their businesses post COVID. But these policies, they really need to be thought through. I mean, we, we've spoken already today about the fantastic announcement initially from the government on this 160 million investment in onshore wind. Um, and the increase in targets from 30 to 40 gigawatts by 2030. But there's a lot more around that. The government must help industry in achieving more through than just funding it. And Malcolm earlier on mentioned a holistic attitude. The policy change, like an extra 10 gigawatts in the same time frame, needs to be more backed up by associated policy change. Uh, it needs to help enable the industry deliver against such targets. I mean, there's gonna to have to be a massive network reinforcement for National Grid to be able to deliver that 10 gigawatts in the same time frame, And all that needs to go through planning consent and the various associated risks regarding time frames and investment. So there's a lot more that needs to be done, potentially policy-wise to support the delivery of that. And the same goes for EVs, moving the deadline on, on manufacturing diesel and petrol cars. Again, a great headline, but there's so much associated infrastructure that's needed to support that switch to EVs. So apart from these headlines, we've seen delays in energy white papers, the national infrastructure statement, probably the two clearest indicators of how our sector can move forward uh, against long-term government policy. But uh, at least one thing they have mentioned, and, and Kim rightfully said that the airport national policy statement did fall foul of the fact it no, made no mention of net zero. They are going to re revisit the national uh, policy statement for energy, which is at least promising, although they haven't actually said by when. Um, so what realistically is the way forward? We know politicians like headlines, governments come and go and rarely really want to get bogged down into the detail. Well, fortunately, the solution often comes from the private sector. We've heard already from Clementine Octopus with their fantastic variation tariffs. You've got people like SatMap coming up with their one payment system to get around the problem. In fact, we've got 40 different EV charger suppliers on the market at the moment. And innovation will be a major player in this green recovery. Um, with his recent statement on wind, the PM talked about the UK well, wind being to the UK what oil is to the Saudis and promise these 60,000 UK green jobs, which is fantastic, and grants for innovation. But I slightly challenge this attitude. Admittedly, one factor politicians love about renewables is that it's usually 100% domestically generated. There's no risk of import sources. 
probably hence the reference to the Saudis uh, being generated by that. But we all know that because of the baseload question, that renewables can only ever be part of the mix. We'll still need nuclear, uh, which involves uranium from Australia. Interconnectors need copper from Chile. Batteries need cobalt from the Gonga. The list goes on and on. The UK cannot be net zero, and it can't be delivered solely by the UK alone. We need partners abroad. We need a global solution. And even renewables aren't safeguard. I mean, most of our panels come from China for solar. So, you know, 160 million for wind is great, but we can't be insular about these things. So getting back to innovation, we need into really to be inventing something that people need, something that people can buy into. And rarely is funding in the place of rapid testing and rollout. I mean, the, the Brompton bike, I mentioned folding bikes, actually took over 13 years from design to production. Um, so what we need to speed up this innovation process is collaboration, both from ideas, innovation and funding. And it needs to be done at a global level because, I mean, surely one thing we've, we've learned from C19 is that international collaboration can produce results. We're supposedly all working together globally on a vaccination. Um, and it's the same going for climate change. We need a cure for that as well. And I use the word cure purposefully uh, because in the long term, climate change is going to kill far more of us than COVID ever will. So we shouldn't be talking about 60,000 jobs. We would probably talk about 600,000 collaborative, community-driven global jobs. We want to be able to share our knowledge and to actually pass it on to other governments, other communities, and actually spread the ability to, to hit net zero target on a, a global level. And to be able to do this, the UK has to lead by example. I mean, lead, because bar giving, I don't know, Greta Thunberg, the world's nuclear weapons and the right to use them on the naughty countries. We need somebody who's actually going to, to stamp their foot down and some kind of power to do that. And here's the uh, idealistic bit. Perhaps somebody mentioned, I think, using CO, uh, COP26. What we need to do is lobby world leaders to agree on a tariff and subsidy system that's based on CO2 footprints. And then that would be a major start in driving collaboration and in, in, investment and innovation sharing. So solar panels coming from China would be cheaper, but not if they've involved cargo shipments from all over the world. And such a mechanic could keep renewable costs down, protect local jobs where viable, and drive innovation into greener solutions through the supply chain, such as hydrogen container ships. Because at the end of the day, the clock is ticking, and we need rapid global change through innovation, not protectionist attitudes. I mean, the French have a great system on their travel tickets. Everything has a CO2 footprint on it. And we also be doing the same thing with our labeling. So we know that those bananas have a lower CO2 footprint than those out of season strawberries. And the same goes for infrastructure projects. We need an accountable CO2 targets covering both the operation, the construction throughout the whole supply chain. And of course, such a solution has its flaws, policing being one of them. If we're not going to have a truly effective green recovery, then we need to think climate change as the new COVID and think of it on a global scale. We all need to be working together on a cure. And in a sense, we all need to be that NASA cleaner that Kim mentioned. Thank you very much. Thanks very much, uh, Jamie, for that. Um, as always, um, insightful and a little bit um, provocative, I think, uh, as well. <laughs> Um, so now we have um, the opportunity to have um, our, our, our discussion and I just want to start off um, with um, a question that I'm going to pose in the first instance uh, to, Kim, to Kim Yates. Um, just on this issue, it seems to me that there's a lot of predictions from climate scientists in particular that lead to an almost acceptance that the planet is, is doomed really. Um, unless we take action. If so, how, how can the infrastructure industry change that narrative 
and that pulling back from the abyss, if you like, is actually possible and is actually realistic. How can we inject that optimism that uh, Clementine spoke about in, in, you know, into this particular uh, uh, subject? Start off with that one with, uh, with you, Kim. Okay. Um, so, yeah, you're right. The climate scientists are, are, we're all sitting there going, yes, we're doomed, we're doomed. Um, but um, I am ever the optimist and I loved listening to Clementine. And it is all about, I think I, I mentioned it, touched on it, is that if we do everything in terms of compliance and just ticking the boxes, yeah, we may be in a, have a few issues in the infrastructure sector. But if we go above and beyond that, um, I, I think we are, as a species, I think we are adaptable. I think we can do that paradigm shift that we need to avert that crisis that the climate scientists are, are um, uh, pointing, uh, pointing us in the direction of. But also, I suppose what I'm seeing within, within my own industry, I have... I've, I've been around a long time and I have never seen an environment like this before where the will to do something and to do it better is actually there. So I'm going to give you an example going back to my company, MOTS, is that um, we, we put a plan together to go carbon neutral, put a nice risk averse, very lovely plan for, to go carbon neutral in 2022. Our chief exec turned around and said, no, I want it in 2020. So then went, okay, we can do that. <laughs> and we did. We went um, carbon neutral, a lot of hard work for a very large global company. We went carbon neutral last week. We got the certification to say we're there. However, as a company and as part of our DNA, we realized that this is only a small step on that journey to net zero. So, and we have plans in place to, to take that forward. But again, I would never have seen that 10 years ago. And I would never have seen that push and that pull from our clients, from our own internal organization. The will is there. Um, we've just got to make it so, just like um, Clementine has done. Hopefully I'm pronouncing your name right. <laughs> <laughs> it's actually Clementine, but Clem Clementine. Was just <laughs> um, yeah, which I loved. Basically, show us the money, walk the talk. I think we have the will to do it, and we also have the technology to do it. So we just get on with it as an industry. Thanks for that. Uh, thanks for that, Kim. Uh, just just turning turn back to you, Donald. Just on that on that on that very same issue. Um, you know, do, do you think our sector is optimistic enough? Do you, do you think that we're out there enough and, 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 and actually discussing with influencing government and other key stakeholders on this issue that there is, you know, we can do this? Yeah, can you ever, can, can we ever say we're doing enough, Andy? Probably not. Um, certainly, again, speaking personally and for our organisation, absolutely. Um, I rarely have a week where I do not have a government minister at stereo meeting. I think part of the challenge, though, is there are so many other bodies around that are uh, trying to lobby but maybe aren't as effective. And I also think there's a bigger disconnect now between government and you know some of the agencies as well, and that you know the, the civil servants. And I've seen you know that that kind of behaviour recently. It's almost just pulling it back. That belief that we we can't overcome the inevitability. So I think, you know, almost everybody today has spoken about data. And I think we need to start believing the data, use the data to, to take more objective decisions and smarter decisions that actually make us more resilient and accelerate our journey. So I think absolutely could we, we, we need to do more engagement. Let's get that belief. Let's get that ambition. And let's start trying. Um, you know, the gestation period for infrastructure is just too long in this country. And I think people, certain parts of certain stakeholders thrive in putting obstacles up rather than enablers. And I think that there is absolutely that appetite now to really focus on it. And we're seeing that from the top of a number of our client organisations. So I think there's many legitimate reasons to be optimistic. 
Thanks very much for that, uh, Donald. Stuart, you said when you spoke that um, really people should only work with people who get it, with firms that get it. I mean, great, in theory. Um, how do we make sure that happens in practice? How do we practically make sure that that happens? Well, I think we need um, organisations to make uh, make the decision that they want to get the right people on board. You know, there's a, a phrase of get the right people on the bus. You know, so many, many companies, you know, and, and quite a number of those who are on this, this um, webinar today have made significant investments to make sure that they can deal with these issues, that they understand the issues and can provide professional support. So, you know, I think in the next few years, uh, not just in the UK, but across Europe and beyond, Government is going to be the only show in town. It's going to be the only buyer of, of major projects and services or only significant buyer of major uh, projects and services. And they can quite simply make a decision that when they look to work with others, they're going to only work with those that actually can add value, those that know what they're doing and those with the skills and expertise to, to actually make a difference here. And, and I, like uh, Donald and Kim, I'm, I'm very positive that we can make a change here, but, but now is the time. Time is definitely of the essence and we need to just embed it within everything we do going forward. Thanks, Stuart. Uh, just want to turn to, uh, to, to Phil Graham for a minute. We've got a, an interesting question that's come through, and this is about, I suppose, making things, you know, sort of joining things up better and making things happen. John Thompson uh, says that, again, somewhat provo provocatively, we're never going to achieve a green recovery net zero or the circular economy until the government changes the building regulations and makes them fit for purpose. And he cites the example that currently there's no requirement to deal with hard water line scale, which wastes massive amounts of energy and water and damages appliances and fixtures and fittings in more than half of the UK. You know, what's your thoughts on that? You've worked in, in you know, for the National Infrastructure Commission in the past, and obviously you have some knowledge of of building regulations so on. How do we make sure that we join all of this up so that we're all not just singing from the same, same hymn sheet, but actually playing the same instruments? Um, I mean, I think, I mean, I, 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 I couldn't profess to be an expert about hard, about hard water within the building regulations, but I think what is true is that the built environment sector um, there is a risk that it that it becomes a gap in this you know the 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 infrastructure sectors actually are are pretty well infrastructure firms those developing them not least because it's predominantly as Stuart was saying you know it's either government investment or it's heavily regulated private investment which which creates that the built environment sector is much more about um, direct private sector in investment in these things and the role therefore of the buildings regulations in the planning system is critical and one of the biggest uh, worries that we always had as uh, that we have had as London but also that we picked up on when I was at the National Infrastructure Commission was the step away from sort of building properly zero carbon homes into the planning system and actually in the you know in the draft London plan that requirement is still that would still be will still be there within the at the London level, um, but at national level there there was a stepping back from that. Now the planning reforms that we've seen, um, the, the sort of the white paper that the government's published, um, have a lot of warm words in them about the importance of delivering, uh, about the importance of delivering um, sort of sustainable sustainable homes and sustainable buildings but it's hard to understand the detail that sits underneath that and how it would happen particularly in the context of a broad approach which i mean ultimately is more laissez-faire than the current system it's about trying to streamline the planning process and make it easier to build to bring to bring projects forward without having having sort of regulatory barriers and planning barriers in the way so so i'm concerned i'm concerned about this i think building regulations regulations as well is something that need to be need to be looked at and need to be taken into account the CCC's had a lot to say about this but it's you know this is hard stuff you know the 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 way in which you know carbon flow through the system the way in which our air quality is damaged you know filters through a huge mass of different levers and different uh, Diff different uh, parts of the policy making system and of the commercial system that affected in different ways and and 
John Thompson is absolutely right. You know, we need to look at how the interactions between these work and we need to look at those areas that are creating perverse incentives or, or are missing out options. Equally, I'm concerned, uh, I'm skeptical rather than concerned perhaps of sort of blanket uh, 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 solutions that say, if we just get this bit of the building regulations right, then everything else will follow. You've got to take an approach that thinks about how the system works. Thanks for that. Uh, thanks for that, Phil. I just want to bring um, Clementine back in for a second. You mentioned when you spoke about, you know, this question of optimism and, and you know, before um, we, um, you know, we started this, um, you know, webinar, I looked at your website and um, it, there is optimism running through it, really. I mean, obviously, you've got something very optimistic and very forward thinking to sell, but you know, I'm, I'm going to, I suppose I'm going to kind of put you on the spot a little bit here. Um, if you were advising our industry on how to be more optimistic about the solutions that they have at their disposal to solve some of these issues, what, what would that be? And also just, just give us some insights if you can about how you have actually, you know, engaged with government around some of these issues as well. I actually um, found that question about standards really interesting. Clearly, I know. I mean, I didn't even know that the hard water issue was an issue. So that's how little I know about building standards. But what I would say is that um, I, what well, I joined Octopus Energy um, to lead our campaign for an energy price cap, um, which, as you may well know, was ultimately successful. And I think that um, our that. That, that you know is a sort of standard it's a it's a it's a um you know it, it it describes how how much an energy company can can charge for a service and it basically it provides a standard on on the the cost of a thing versus the service that you're giving um and i, f I find that um that standards can be extremely powerful because they um, drive innovation. As soon as the energy price cap happened, energy companies started investing in digital technologies to um, underpin their operations in order to make them more efficient and, and better value for customers. Um, and I think uh, the same is likely to happen. You know, clearly, you have to always, always be careful about over specifying regulations so that you don't you know that so you don't determine the solution but those standards are so important in driving innovation for new solutions and i think that sometimes i've noted I've, you know in previous jobs i've i've um uh, been on the other side of the table from um some of the house builders and and the kind of you know absolutely sort of vicious lobbying against standards and and new homes was was a real shock and i think demonstrates a pessimism because if you know, I think part of being optimistic is, is in saying, yeah, if you put these standards in place and we will do it, no problem. We know, we know what we're doing. We can innovate. We back ourselves to, to deliver the solutions for what you're asking us to do. And we'll just get on and do it. And I, so I think a big part of the optimism is in, is in being ambitious around standards and around what you hope to deliver and by when, and therefore being you know welcoming regulation as a driver of innovation um you know cr you know w well well drafted regulation and not not innovate not, not regulation that necessarily that that, that over specifies what it how, how it is that you go about doing it but standards that that describe um you know a, a, a an accelerated journey to net zero should be welcomed by all of us and companies that that think of themselves as, as innovators and as solutions providers and as and as good sustainable businesses should be optimistic and ambitious about about carrying those out. What was the second question? I'll just I'll just leave that there for a minute because I want to come back. The, the, the second question partly talks about the, the overall profile of this issue, and I want to actually end the webinar with the same question to everybody. So if I may, Clementine, I, to, to, you know, I'll come back to you on that. I just want to bring Donald uh, Morrison back in. Um, uh, I, I was interested when you spoke uh, and you talked about uh, the need for everybody really, not just to build, 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 but to think, think, think about some of these issues. And also, you know, the question of urgency that we need to act now. Um, have we got that across enough, um, you know, as an industry, that actually this isn't something that we can just, you know, you know, think about in the years to come. This is now, you know, the, the people, you know, at the end of the day around the world who are on the streets 
protesting on this issue uh, of sustainability you know how do we if you like make sure that as an industry we actually are grasping the seriousness and the urgency of this situation how do we do that are we doing it yeah again probably like my last response andy we're probably not doing it enough maybe if i could come at it from a, a couple of perspectives I'm a great believer in the, the, the imperatives around engagement with um, the general public and stakeholders. And I think it's too often still the case that people feel like projects are being done to them rather than for them. So actually, how do we recalibrate that narrative with the, with the general public? And there's probably a lot we could learn from an organization um, like Octopus Energy and by looking at other, you know, other markets in that space. And certainly um, that that's a kind of key way that we are leading on a lot of the programs now and that we can look at, you know, regional impacts of schemes rather than the corridor impacts of schemes. And I think that, that that's a key kind of point in this space. But I think there's, there's a number of good examples, as I said earlier, and a number of us have said that there are really good reasons to be optimistic um, in, in this area at the moment. And I can see a number of our clients really leading that change, but I think we need to be bolder. I think we need to tell better stories of where it is working, and that's certainly a real focus for us. We're doing some great pro um, projects and programs where we're starting to see that that uh, some of these ideas really come to bear. And I think a, a couple of years back, I heard one of the world's top master planners speaking and he sh showed a couple of hundred slides in his presentation, only two with words on them. And one of them, he flashed the word ego up and then he clicked his mouse button and the word we came up in front of it. And he said the problem with big, ma big master planning is the egos get in the way of we goes. So I think we've got all the skills in the business and in the industry. We need to get a few more pilot projects off the ground in regions rather than just isolated projects. And then we will get the we go effect. Um, and I think we can have that effect as a, as a country and we need to have that effect. Thanks, uh, thanks, Donald. Um, as ever, as always, we're, we're running out of time and I want to, I, I want to ask um, a, a kind of final question to everybody really. And, it, and it's going to give you an opportunity, I hope, and also put you on the spot uh, a little bit. It's already been mentioned next year, postponed from this year's COP, uh, 26, where really the UK is going to be in, hopefully, um, you know, the um, the international spotlight around this uh, particular issue, um, and and so, so 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 really, what I'm going to you know ask each of our panelists to do is, what do they think should be, uh, you know, a short, sharp, central message? Almost, you know, you've been given the job of summing the conference up, but hopefully just in you know a few sentences what do you think our central message should be from such a, an important uh, global uh, global event uh, and if i start with uh, stuart cairns first of all stuart how do you think you know we should be framing what we're doing at that event thanks andy you have absolutely put us on the spot um i think i think the central message is that we uh, in the uk understand the importance of this not just for for us but for the world and that we are absolutely committed to getting it right. You know, you've talked about the urgency. I think, I think that's obviously true. But, you know, investment in infrastructure is a 30 to 50 year investment. So we don't want to race to do things wrong. We want to race to make good decisions and then implement them right. So for me, it's about saying we're, we're mindful of, of what we want to do. And we're mindful that there's a huge investment to be made to make those right decisions and then committed to implement them, not just for for the UK, but for on a global basis. Thanks, Stuart. Philip, your view on that COP, COP26, you're there, the global spotlight's on you. What's the central message do you think we should be getting across? Um, I'm, I'm going to cheat and have two. Um, the first is that the, uh, you know, the, the dichotomy between environmental benefits and commercial benefits has disappeared. Now, this is the right environmental choice is the right financial choice and the right commercial choice. And I think we need you know, many across the sector understand that. But in the public debate, I don't think that is clearly enough understood. And it's still the, the narrative is still that 
know, by making the right, right environmental choice, you're somehow making a sacrifice. And that's absolutely not the, not the case. So that's number one. But the other one, which I think in COP26 more so than anywhere, but is is critical even when we think about this nationally, the idea of a just transition has to be at the heart of this. We need to understand the way in which the changes that we're talking about play out differentially across our communities and make sure that we have that, it, that those effects are felt as fairly as possible. Thanks for that. Uh, thanks for that, Philip. Uh, Kim, um, COP26. COP26. So, uh, yes, the, the eyes of the world will be on Glasgow next year. Um, and having worked in infrastructure um, globally, I can, I can say with hand on heart, actually, the UK, we are leading in terms of low carb solutions, overall sustainable outcomes um, across the world. Um, so with that, I suppose it's, it's looking, we understand what we're doing. Um, as, as a country, we've still got a way to go. We can't do this alone, but we've also got to be aware of unforeseen consequences and focusing too much on, on climate change, but also look at um, the other sustainable outcomes in terms of social and environmental. So I think that, that would be my key message. But in the UK, we, we should pat ourselves on the back. We are we are good in this space, still got a long way to go, but we're good in this space. Donald, uh, Boris Johnson's gone down with the flu and they've gone to someone in Glasgow, uh, which is you. Uh, so what, what's your, what would your central message be at the end of COP26? What, what do you think we should be getting out there with? Yeah, I would need to get my blonde curly locks back, I think, Andy, first of all. Um, so no, I, I think it would be a, you know, a lot of what Kim said there. I think we've got a great opportunity to really overcome you know, probably a good few decades of inevitability. I still believe we are absolutely leading the world here. But in a kind of post-Brexit UK, I think it's a, it's a new show, it's, you know, it's a new stage to really show our level of ambition in this space in a bold way. And I think, you know, share some of the great stories of good practices that we've got at the moment and um, have some pride without complacency, but it's got to be around storytelling of, of where, how we really want to uh, lead the world in this space. And I, and I honestly believe we can and we are at the moment, but there's an opportunity to really accelerate on that journey. Thanks, Donald. Jamie, at BECG, you guys are really experienced in crafting um, communications messages um, for built environment organisations, but I'm cracking you up the scale here even more than our own esteemed sector, and you're now crafting it for the government. What do you think the central message should be uh, at COP26? I, I, I like Donald's idea of, of better stories because you know we are successful at what we do with, with the green uh, investment in our infrastructure. And it's something we should be proud of and we should share. Um, and I think I, I spoke a lot about collaboration and the sharing of, of innovation um, on a global scale. And I think it would be very interesting to have some form of, or almost like a kind of Oscars of some of those fantastic initiatives we've done and the innovations we've come up with as a country and show it to the world and may be in a position to roll out that IP um, globally to, to help on a global scale when it comes to climate change. I, I think it's our chance to be the stars, and we are the stars, so, so let's shout about it. Thanks very much, Jamie. And just to, to finish off on, you talked about Oscars, you talked about stars. Um, Octopus Energy uh, are a key player in this, uh, in this sector. Um, and, and finishing off with, with yourself, uh, Clementine, what, what do you hope for from COP26? What would be the central message that you would try and get over if you were crafting that end of conference communique for Boris Johnson? It'd probably just be, this is easy, let's get on with it. You know, we already know how to, how to decarbonize 70% of the, like today, we know how to decarbonize energy. We know we can, we can do it and we know how to do it. So let's just crack on with that. Likewise, heating and transport. There's some like hard to reach bits, but let's just do what we know we can do now. And it's, I think that our responsibility as 
um, you know, this cross sectoral responsibility, it's both in energy, but also from you guys, from people, you know, wouldn't it be fantastic if every single home that we built from between now and COP26 was zero carbon, not just zero carbon ready, actually zero carbon with a heat pump and green energy supply and, 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 and high efficiency standards and the rest of it. If we show and tell, if we can demonstrate what we're capable of because we are capable of it, we can do this right now, then other, com other governments don't have any excuse not to get on with it in their own economies. And we get to export that expertise around the world. So it's win-win it's and, and it's, you know, there will be stuff that's hard to do, but let's do what we can do now because that's a big chunk of it. Thanks very much. I think that's a really excellent message on which, on which to finish. This is easy. Let's get on with it as a message to government on this really important issue. We're out of time, as we always are. Just want to thank our fantastic panel for what I think has been a really, really good discussion. Thanks to Donald Morrison, to Kim Yates, to Phil Graham, to Stuart Cairns, to Clementine Counton, and to Jamie Gordon uh, from BECG. And a big thanks again to BECG for their support for the Infrastructure Intelligence live series of events. Keep an eye on our website. Keep an eye on our email that will drop in your inbox um, probably on Monday morning uh, after this event. We'll also have a recording of the webinar online for you as well. Uh, lots more events coming up uh, with, uh, with, with infrastructure and intelligence. But for now, I think, you know, again, that point that, um, that Donald made, that we need to think, think, think about these issues, but we also need to really raise the profile and engage with government and let them know that this is not just possible and feasible, it's absolutely essential and we need to get on with it. So thanks again to all of our panel uh, for their time today. And it just remains for me, Andy Walker, to say goodbye and hopefully to see you again. And all of our panel will now wave bye-bye as well. Thanks very much, guys. Have a great weekend. See you very, very soon. Bye-bye. <laughs>